Hey, everyone. Before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. And if you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I am joined by repeat guest Darius Dale, 42 Macro. Darius, welcome to the show. Mike, what's up, brother? How you doing? It's great to see you. I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Um, always, I always enjoy our conversations, man. I have uh, I was looking forward to this one. I literally woke up. I was like, damn, I'm chatting with Darius today. This I say, man, awesome. uh, one, thank you for having me again, obviously. I think you're one of the best in the world at what you do um, in terms of having uh, really prepared questions and being thoughtful about kind of where the risk is going in the marketplace. And so I'm just excited to uh, dig in. What I want to get in, by the way, I know you've got a slide deck, so feel free to, if you want to start leafing through. But um, basically what I want to do is start by asking you, like, what's your kind of high level framework for where we are? I know I've read your recent report and you're kind of, uh, I think in the sort of, we're in a Goldilocks zone and pretty bullish, especially on the next like sort of three month time frame. So walk us through, like, what are some of the supporting fundamentals that underpin that, that thesis? Yes. 100%, Mike. So uh, I'll share my screen here. Uh, so this first uh, chart here is just, uh, it's not great for TV, but it's great for uh, making money. Uh, this is the sort of uh, the inputs uh, of our global macro risk matrix. So the first thing I do every morning, six days a week uh, here for our clients at 42 Macro is that I refresh our global macro risk matrix. That model tells me based on the momentum, uh, at least uh, according to how the, the current constellation of the, the 42 volatility just momentum signals featured in this table, that tells me what the asset markets are trying to price in. And right now, they're currently pricing in Goldilocks that has the highest sort of share of, of confirming markets or the most love uh, in that table at this current juncture. That's been the case since mid-November. Um, and the reality is, and now that Goldilocks is seemingly starting to peak out, we have to start to ask ourselves questions about, about how long is this Goldilocks regime going to last? Is it going to change at some point in the immediate future? And if it changes at some point in the immediate future, what regime is most likely so we can start putting on and recommending uh, investment portfolio uh, allocations uh, as a function of, of that, that pending transition. And so the second model I refresh every morning for our clients here at 42 Macro is our macro weather model, because that gives us an indication of whether or not we're likely to see an inflection out of the current top-down market regime, which is, which is again, Goldilocks, into something else over a you know kind of short to medium term time horizon. And so what this macro weather model is designed to do is to you know, measure and, and ultimately uh, uh, create signal out of the momentum across the principal components of macro, uh, whether you look at the real economy cycles here on the slide left, uh, that includes growth, inflation, uh, the employment cycle, corporate profit cycle, and fiscal policy. Or if you look at the, um, uh, the, the financial economy cycles here on the right, uh, that includes things like liquidity, credit, interest rates, uh, and positioning. And at any given time, the current constellation of signal for any of these, uh, for, for for each of those principal components of, uh, of macro, contribute independently to each of the um, the uh, composite signals in the middle of the page. So as you can see right now, we have a neutral three month outlook uh, for the stock market. So investors should expect normal returns in the stock market, normal volatility over the next three months. Bond market better than expect, better than normal returns uh, below median volatility in the bond market. Same thing, neutral signal for the dollar, neutral signal for Bitcoin, and bearish signal for commodities. So that's not necessarily saying, hey. The current Goldilocks regime has to end, but it's certainly suggesting that the current Goldilocks regime uh, is does a, it only has at best a middling probability of surviving over the next three months. Uh, and then obviously we layer on our fundamental research, which tends to get the most clicks um, in terms of uh, in terms of helping us project beyond this uh, rolling three month forward time horizon. Awesome. So I want to dig a little bit into this model, Darius, especially for for folks who might not be following uh, along by a video. But uh, you know, I wanted to get a sense. Like, let's let's take a look at at stocks and bonds. And uh, it's been a certainly an interesting uh, two year period for the 60, for, uh, 60 40 portfolio, to to say the least. So you've got bonds with sort of this green circle here, and you know, stocks being a little bit more neutral. So mm -hmm. can you walk us through under the hood? Uh, what's what's what are the the factors that are underpinning those takes? We'll just start. You know, just kind of look at uh, some of unpacking each of these. Uh, principal components on their own. So we'll just use growth as an as a, as a, as an example to kind of answer your question there. And so what we're as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is we want to regime segment each of these component features that each represent one of those ten principal components of macro uh, into specific regimes that allows us to project excess return dispersion back onto the composite signals. And so right now, growth is currently accelerating, as you can see uh, here in the chart. It's trending higher. 
And right now that means it's contributing this excess return dispersion backtest to the overall uh, composite signals in the middle of that previous uh, slide. So stocks tend to, uh, tend to have positive excess returns uh, in a rising growth environment. Uh, you know, the uh, bonds tend to have negative excess returns. The dollar tends to have negative excess returns. Commodities have positive excess returns. And Bitcoin uh, has positive excess returns. Uh, looking at the next component feature, uh, we are currently seeing a minus 110 basis point delta in terms of the real GDP growth uh, next to a month real GDP estimates. So right now, the, the Q1 2025 uh, real GDP estimate is about 110 basis points below the Q1 uh, 2024 estimate. So uh, that helps the model uh, not only have a, uh, uh, that incorporates a forward-looking view on growth uh, into the weather model. And right now, it's contributing this excess return dispersion back test to the model. And that's negative for stocks, negative for bonds, positive for the dollar, negative for commodities, and negative for Bitcoin. And so we're doing that same process daily um, six days a week across each of those 20 principal components of macro that ultimately help us uh, determine, hey, you know, is the next three month outlook for the stock market neutral, bullish or bearish and so on and so forth for each of these uh, uh, component, uh, each of these composite signals here for those five asset classes. And as I mentioned right now, you know, the current constellation is no longer very supportive of the current Goldilocks top down market regime. You know, for the past pr pretty much for the past two and a half months, we've been in Goldilocks. And the weather model was saying, hey, this is a phenomenal time from a from a macroeconomic standpoint for the Goldilocks to persist. Now, when you when we refresh the model and this happened uh, last week, it, we're starting to see signals that maybe it's less likely that Goldilocks persists over the next three months. It's not a slam dunk that it doesn't, but it's certainly less at the margins. And as a function of that, we've taken down risk in our in our KISS portfolio construction process. Mm. And Darius, can, can you when you think about growth, uh, obviously big impact on both stocks and bonds. But what is what is driving the growth picture in the U.S. Uh, I mean, maybe actually just globally right now? Because you know when I think about why I think the factor that so many investors missed when everyone was ardently calling for a recession at the beginning of 2023, which I know you were not. Um, you know, I think the, I think the thing that folks generally missed was the fiscal impulse and these massive deficits that were running and how much how supportive and accommodative that's been to the economy. Um, so it, it doesn't look to me like that's slowing down. Is that still going to be in the driver's seat uh, for the time being? Like, how do you sort of assess the growth picture? Yeah, that's a great question, man. So uh, the fiscal impulse is definitely waning at the margins. In fact, the inflection in the fiscal impulse, as you can see here, we are now trending higher in terms of the uh, sovereign fiscal balance as a percent of nominal GDP. That inflection is what triggered uh, the uh, the downgrade in the stock market outlook and the downgrade in the Bitcoin outlook, as well as the upgrade in the U.S. dollar outlook last week, and so that because of that 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 change, that's obviously a, a it's it's based on the the, the back test. It's telling you that hey, fiscal policy is no longer being supportive at the margins, and so you have to take down risk, or at least the model is recommending that you take down risk to, uh, at the margins to some degree. Uh, you asked a, a very important question um, that sort of. Uh, about you know what's really driving the resiliency of the U.S. economy, and and you and I have talked about this ad nauseum for pretty much 18, 20 months now. Uh, really, actually longer than that, almost almost two years now. Uh, and the reality is, the number one thing that I don't see investors uh, uh, continuing to understand is the resiliency uh, and the strength of the, the the private sector balance sheet here in the U.S. Um, the household balance sheets uh, are you know incredibly flush with cash uh, here in the U.S. Uh, if you look at household leverage, uh, it's not it's cyclically depressed. The household debt service ratio is, is structurally depressed. It's, it's pretty much at an all time low uh, ex COVID. Um, you look at corporate balance sheets, they're flush with cash at 5 percent uh, cash divided by total assets. That's the same uh, ratio as the, the household sector, by the way. Um, you have to go back to the early to mid 1950s to see such a high share of cash on corporate uh, and household balance sheets here in the U.S. And then you have you know things like corporate debt service ratios. They're much much more elevated than the household debt service ratio, uh, but they're not uh, you know they're not at levels that have historically been consistent uh, with recessions uh, and therefore. So you know when I think about the resiliency of the U.S. economy, it starts with the starting point of balance sheets are incredibly resilient. So a lot of the policy rate tightening that we've seen out of the Fed and even balance sheet runoff that we've seen as well has been mostly noise. And if you understood these dynamics from the outset, you would have realized that it was mostly noise. Um, you brought up a secondary point on fiscal policy, and I think that's important to unpack as well, because we have seen uh, a tremendous amount of fiscal uh, uh, stimulus uh, in the economy, particularly last year in 2023. Uh, and so if you go back to uh, last year, some of the things that really contributed uh, to the uh, robustness of the fiscal impulse. Um, one of those things was uh, the uh, decline in individual income tax collect and tax receipts. 
Uh, they were down 16% on a year-to-date, year-over-year basis uh, throughout 2023. These are numbers through December. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that uh, we had wildfires and other natural disasters in, in, in California and Hawaii uh, that really you know, kind of uh, re- contributed to reduce federal withholding for those particular states. Now, that's obviously going to change uh, in 2024. Uh, and then another thing, we had a pretty sizable cost of living increase adjustment uh, in 2023. Uh, the COLA was a plus 8.7%. That number is going to decline to 3.2% in 2024. And how that's going to flow through in terms of a reduced fiscal impulse uh, is, you know, things like Medicare, which is 14% of uh, total uh, federal expenditures, Social Security, which is 22% of federal expenditures. Those numbers are growing, uh, those uh, those expenditures are growing uh, 17% and 12% respectively. They're not going to grow 17 and 12% in 2024 because, again, the cost of living increase adjustment is is less than half of what it was in uh, in 2023. And so when you kind of um, do this on a year over year, nominal basis in terms of the year to date run rate. You know, we were up about eight hundred and thirty four billion dollars in June in terms of the federal budget deficit. Uh, that number dwindled to up five up only five hundred and thirty five billion in August. But we're tracking up around three hundred and sixty four billion in December. So not falling off a cliff, but it darn sure ain't eight hundred and thirty four billion in, or even in close to five hundred and thirty five billion. So it is waning at the margins and, and that at the margins should see uh, growth uh, slow uh, at the margins uh, due to, uh, you know, kind of less resilient household income support. Hey, everyone. We'll be back to the program in just a moment. But before we return, wanted to let you know about DAS London. DAS London is the largest institutionally focused conference in crypto hosted by Blockworks. But I wanted to give you an update because we are now 10 times oversubscribed for this conference. So the bad news is we have actually got to lower, as much as I love you guys, the listeners, we've got to lower our discount rate to margin 10. That's going to get you 10% off. I would highly recommend that you do that soon because you might have noticed ticket prices have gone up 200 pounds and they're only going up from here. And I actually can't guarantee that we're going to have this discount rate forever. Since we last talked, we've had a whole bunch of new great speakers sign up for the conference. We've got Brad Garlinghouse as a keynote. We've got Pascal Gauthier as a keynote. We've got new speakers signed on from Goldman Sachs, from Franklin Templeton, uh, from some of the largest family offices and allocators based out of the Europe. So Theta Capital Management, L1 Digital. And actually on day one of the conference, we're going to be having an investor day, which is a Chatham House Rules hosted by some of the largest investors in crypto. Then the other thing that happened is we've got our VIP tickets that just went live. There are only 60, but we've actually had a bunch of them that just sold out even in one day. So if you want to be a VIP at the conference, make sure you get your ticket. And again, use code MARGIN10 uh, to hang out with me and Mark uh, March 18th to the 20th in sunny London. Cheers. Now, Darius, what do you make of the fact that 2024 is going to be an election year? You know, you've sort of got two camps of this, which is, hey, the the policymakers don't really adjust um, either fisc- on the fiscal or monetary side, depending on what's going on with the presidential election. On the other hand, you have a very ardent group of folks that say, actually, yes, yes, they do, because these uh, incumbents, be it someone who works at Treasury or someone who works at the Fed, um, have an interest to stay in power and, you know, maintain their roles. And, you know, what the if I was putting my tinfoil cap on heading into 2024, yeah, we're starting to talk about interest rate cuts, which I understand there's a lot of very good, solid logic that underpins that. But I'd, I'd be curious, do you think that the 2024 election year comes into play here at all? Yeah, no. So uh, I think we have to start with the baseline that, you know, elections are generally very positive and very favorable. Um, If you look at, you know, sort of um, the 12 month uh, return heading into uh, uh, elections, you know, it's somewhere around about plus 8 percent, which is, you know, right in the median return of the stock market over the long period of time. However, when you have a Democrat incumbent running, that that median return doubles to about 15 percent on a year in terms of the 12 months leading up to uh, up to the election. That uh, return is about plus 8 percent with a Democrat uh, incumbent running on a median basis in the six months leading up to recession and the percent positive ratios, which I think is just as important statistic uh, for these uh, particular um, particular uh, time horizons, is plus 89 percent and 84 percent respectively. So, you know, the baseline from a frequentist probability perspective is that you should be expecting positive outcomes uh, throughout 2024 purely as a function of this election uh, factor. Uh, when you layer on some of the decisions that we continue to see out of the um, out of the Treasury in terms of supporting liquidity, I think it's going to be an incrementally supportive factor. Um, Janet Yellen has been doing a masterful job of of running uh, U.S. fiscal policy, in my opinion, uh, and has been doing a masterful job of running U.S. fiscal policy for for quite a while, especially considering all the the noise and the nonsense that's going on in D.C. around the uh, shutdowns and whatnot. And so this chart here shows a net marketable borrowing. On a composition basis, uh, the red uh, bar, the red bars uh, correspond to bills, uh, and the blue bars correspond to. Um, oh, sorry, the red bars correspond to coupons. The blue bars correspond 
to T-bills. And as you can see on a trailing 12-month basis, through the end of Q1 of 2024, we're talking 27% of, of net issuance, uh, net financing from the private sector will be uh, a coupons versus 73% for bills. Now, a couple of things I'll say about that. That 27% is the lowest ratio we've seen since at least Q1 of 18. And more importantly, it's a very anomalous relative to the Treasury's stated objectives of generally issuing around 20% uh, T-bills and around uh, 80% coupons. And so in my opinion, Yellen is obviously violating the Treasury's sort of stated objectives and has been doing so for pretty much about since the beginning of 2023. And the reason we think she's doing that is because she continues to see uh, excess demand for T-bills in the form of the $600 billion uh, sitting here uh, in the reverse repo facility balance. So in our opinion, she's going to continue to attack this uh, just so that, you know, that she's not creating problems in financial markets from an indigestion perspective uh, in a year where her boss is seeking re-election. There was a lot of uh, a lot of ado made about the fact that Yellen was breaking that that ratio of uh, that 80-20 ratio. But I, I feel like, I mean, what I guess with the benefit of hindsight, it actually looks like a not a bad move because we had all of this liquidity in the reverse repo facility that she was essentially targeting, right? She was trying to get money market funds out of there. So I don't know. I, I feel like we, you know, a lot of the time for good reason, give policymakers at either the Fed or the Treasury quite a bit of stick. But you know, you kind of got to hand it to them when they do well. I mean, it sounds like it looks like she sort of threaded that needle, uh, at least from where I said. There's another needle that needs to be talked about as well in terms of threading uh, is the needle uh, that Jay Powell is threading on in terms of uh, generating a soft landing uh, in the U.S. economy. Now, the jury's still out on that. We do believe that a soft landing is the highest probability outcome at the current juncture. Uh, we are not in any camp. You know, we're in the camp that allows us to make and save money uh, in terms of tech cap, you know, capitalizing on the momentum and asset markets at any given time. Um, but for now, we do believe a soft landing is the highest probability outcome. And that's exactly what Jay Powell outlined at the beginning of the tightening cycle. Recall that in March of 2022, you know, when he said we're going to have to, you know, Jack, I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, he's, they don't talk like this. But when they effectively outlined that they're going to have to jack interest rates higher to contain inflation and, and really get inflation back to target. One of the things he said was was pretty stocking at the time, which was, you know, I don't think this is going to cause a recession. And the reason he didn't think it was going to cause a recession is because he explicitly said we could create slack in the labor market uh, through a reduction in total job openings and not through a reduction in total employment. And that's exactly what we've seen really for almost two years now. Now, this is a very anomalous uh, uh, setup here. We've almost never seen, uh, you know, kind of a divergence in these two time series uh, for such a long period of time. So who knows? Uh, when this uh, when this divergence uh, you know culminates, but the reality is, as long as the, it continues, and this has obviously been going on for almost two years now, we're going to see a reduction in the uh, excess uh, uh, demand in the labor market relative to, to supply. You know that's what this uh, this uh, the shaded area curve in this chart and here in this in this fourth panel uh, indicates. That's the spread between labor demand, which is the sum of total job openings and household survey employment, uh, minus labor supply, which is just the total size of the labor force. That peaked at about six million. In I want to say March of 2022, and it's somewhere around 2.5 million now. And so that all that slack that's been created, that 3.5 million uh, uh, work, workers worth of slack, has really come in the form of reduction in total job openings. And if it continues, we will soft land this plane from an economic standpoint. And so you'd have to tip your cap to uh, obviously Treasury Secretary Yellen for you know not creating as uh, you know for tam toning down the indigestion and uh, in the, the, the potential indigestion the bond market would have obviously uh, experienced uh, given the, the move we saw in rates over the past couple of years. But you also have to tip your cap to Jay Powell, who is now acknowledging that we are on a steady path towards a potential soft landing and are now starting to think about you know easing policy uh, to actually uh, support uh, that outcome. You know, it, maybe it just eluded me uh, until now, but that relationship between job openings and unemployment is just interesting because we we lost so many uh, so many folks from the labor force, uh, but obviously job openings exploded because it was so tight. So, yeah, it, it actually didn't it didn't really click with me until I just saw that that graph that you just outlined. But it actually makes perfect sense that that's um, that was his goal. And it yeah, was like, no, I mean, it was it's it's bizarre. Like this has been a very bizarre business cycle. I mean, I, I fancy myself, you know, one of the one of the top econometricians on you know on Global Wall Street, and I think about this all the time. Where if you are relying on models that have been good at predicting business cycle outcomes from, let's say, 1980 to 2020. Those, none of those models are still working. 
Uh, neither the autoregressive models, the the, the the DSG models, those are all broken because we are in a new paradigm from a nominal GDP perspective. We're in a new paradigm. We were, at least for now, for, for the last few years, in a new paradigm from the perspective of inflation. And we were certainly in a new paradigm from the perspective of fiscal policy. We've never seen such aggressive fiscal policy in the history of the U.S. economy outside of a major war, you know, outside of, you know, something like uh, World War II. Uh, you know, just throw a couple of statistics at you. You know, we uh, uh, the, in terms of the, the growth of the federal budget deficit, it grew six trillion dollars from the beginning of 2020 to the end of 2021. And the Fed monetized 52 percent of that. I mean, that's insane. Of course, we had an inflation problem. Of course, we're still dealing with cash sloshing around both the economy and asset markets. And ultimately, uh, you know, that's uh, it's, you know, in, in some respects, it's actually contributing to some of these positive economic outcomes, certainly relative to a, a hyper bearish consensus at the beginning of last year. Yeah, just bizarre. And I, I will say just because I know I'm going to get shredded in YouTube comments for defending <laughs> Janet Yellen and Chair Jerome Powell. I will Don't say, I, I'm, I'm the whole line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I think the other side of this argument would be, and I've heard Dan Moorhead articulate this of Pantera Capital pretty articulately, which is, you know, on the other hand, we did pay a cost for everything that policymakers have done, which is just an astounding amount of debt that uh, so someone is eventually going to have to work off in, in one way, shape or another. Household financing isn't exactly the same as government financing. I get that. But, you know, it's not like I guess it's inaccurate to say that there was no cost here. There was actually a tremendous cost to the fiscal position. In the US. <laughs> well, and don't forget, we 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 made, uh, you know, the millions of families that are living paycheck to paycheck. I want to say it's like half of America, if not slightly more than half of America, according to the New York Fed survey is living paycheck to paycheck. Those people can't afford any level of inflation, let alone, you know, kind of the nine, 10 percent, you know, uh, inflation that we saw in 2022. Yeah. Well said, Darius. You know, actually, let, let me ask you um, about inflation specifically and your your sort of outlook. So last week's inflation print came in just a little bit hotter than expected. So, you know, there was an expectation on a month over month basis for headline to be at point two. We we're at point three, you know, year over year, three point two versus three point four, which is what we actually got. Uh, and core core was actually relatively where we thought it was going to be. Um, you know, I, I think folks have been a little bit sensitive about a pickup in inflation because historically inflation has proceeded in this very stop start sort of fashion. You go back to the 40s or the 70s, it sort of looks like you've vanquished it. All the signs are trending down, and then it picks right back up again. So, you know, are you are you worried about another pickup in inflation? Do you think we've slayed the inflation monster or is transitory the entire time? Or what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think it's it was there were elements of inflation that were obviously very transitory. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here where we are today, uh, given that, you know, you can make the, the case that the lagged impact of monetary tightening may or may not have even flowed through the economy. We would argue because of the balance sheet, uh, uh, the, the starting balance sheet dynamics we highlighted in the private sector, it was very unlikely to hit the, econ the real economy as, as much as I think of most investors did. Uh, but there are elements of inflation that are very concerning uh, when you look out over the medium term that do pose a risk to the current Goldilocks top-down market regime. And I think by the middle of this year, perhaps, you know, it's a group we could very have be, we, you and I could be having a very different conversation about what the markets are pricing in and what our systems are pricing in from a risk management standpoint. Uh, but I, and, and, uh, so let me allow, allow me to try to chart a path uh, to, to potentially getting there. We are seeing, you know, emergent signs of what we would call sticky inflation. Um, and you could sort of see that through uh, the three month annualized rates of change of things like core CPI. Uh, we got that data point last uh, last uh, week ago on Thursday. Uh, that number slow modestly to 3.3%. But as you can see, we're kind of getting stuck at around 3%, uh, which is much higher than the 2015 to 2019 trend. So the trend rate of core inflation on a three month annualized rate, rate of change basis is much lower than the current level uh, that we're kind of getting stuck at. Um, if you look at super core uh, CBI, so that's core services, X housing, the last four months, we've been kind of stuck around four, four to four to five percent. Um, you know, obviously, so that number is obviously well north of the pre-COVID trend. You see the same dynamics in median CPI. We're kind of, you know, last three or four months, we've been accelerating. We're now at 4.6 percent at well north of the pre-COVID trend. Uh, you look at things like trim mean CPI, uh, that number is kind of basically static around three, three and a half percent over the past three to four months. Uh, and that number is well above trend. So um, this is telling me that at some point in the future, if we don't start to see a resumption of the downward momentum in these time series, let's call it in the next one, two, maximum three CBI reports, then we are going to have a very different narrative amongst market participants around inflation because you know a lot of the immaculate disinflation that we've observed as market participants has really come in the form of, of the PCE deflator statistics. 
know, the CPI statistics have been a lot less um, uh, supportive of this immaculate disinflation uh, narrative. But as we were talking about, I think I've had this conversation with you on your program last year, the positioning cycle in the markets were basically ripe for markets latching on to anything positive and causing uh, causing a ferocious rally uh, throughout 2023, particularly in the second half of the year when the institutional guys were forced to chase performance. Uh, so going back to this uh, uh, the PC deflator, you know, we continue to see tre- textbook disinflation in the core PC deflator, which is what the Fed's preferred inflation metric is. You know, the three month annualized is at 2.1 percent, six month annualized is at 1.9 percent. The year over year is at 3.2 percent. But if these numbers, you know, continue to huddle out where they are, obviously the year over year numbers are going to uh, trace that down. On a lag, we're seeing similar dynamics in Supercore PC uh, deflator. Uh, we're at 2.8% three-month annualized, 2.6% uh, six-month annualized, and then the 3.5 year-over-year statistics going to chase those down if we can just hang out in that level. Now, if we can just hang out in that level is a very loaded statement, um, and I think you and I have had this conversation before about our uh, hope uh, plus I uh, framework in and around the business cycle. And this is something that's really helped us understand that, hey, we're pricing in Goldilocks now, or I'll be you know, slightly less at the margins. And ultimately, we could be pricing in something that's risk off uh, at some point over the medium term. And we have to be, keep our antenna very uh, uh, up for that is because we understand that inflation typically doesn't do what it's currently doing, which is immaculately disinflate. Um, if you go back and you look at, if you study a basket of uh, uh, macroeconomic indicators, uh, baskets representing uh, a collection of indicators representing housing, orders, production and profits, employment and inflation, what we find is that, you know, of all these particular cycles in the economy, the inflation cycle was the most lagging. And so what we're showing in this chart is, is the, the delta adjusted Z-score for each of these, you know, collections of baskets, the median Z-score, uh, delta adjusted Z-score for the, the indicators in each of these baskets. And what we find is that, you know, in and around late in the business cycle, inflation tends to break down well after a recession begins, which tells me that it's a much, very much a lagging indicator. And so at some point in the future, you know, given the dynamics we just highlighted in, in you know, super core CPI, core CPI, median CPI, trim mean CPI, these might be leading indicators of exactly what we were just talking about with the whole plus I framework, which is you're probably not going to get to 2% inflation and let alone stay there without a recession. And so I think that's something the market's going to have to probably deal with at some point in the medium term. Now, the difference between 42 macro and the reason why our clients are making money as opposed to why I think a lot of other investors are not is a lot of other investors try to predict when that thing is going to happen. A lot of them started 2022, 2023, trying to predict that outcome happening. And guess what? They didn't make any money in a, in a raging bull market. And so in our, it's a, we're, we're going to trust that our systems will get us out of this you know, Goldilocks trade with enough juice and enough profits so that we can rotate into something different that might uh, account for the uh, that might account for the sticky inflation thing that might be developing right in front of our very eyes. So, Darius, based on your your thoughts around inflation, what do you think about how the market is thinking about interest rates for next year? So, obviously, the Fed has signaled that, uh, and and basically the the market is pricing in rate cuts. I believe at last got somewhere between one hundred and twenty five and one hundred and fifty basis points of cuts. So, and most likely that's not going to start until March. So. You, know, you start to reverse engineer, okay, most likely the Fed starts cutting 25 basis points per per FOMC. You know, that kind of has them cutting 25 basis points at every cycle this next year. So I don't know. To me, I've been wrong on this, so who knows? Uh, that feels a little bit optimistic. Uh, and so I'm just like curious you know, what your thought is about how the market is pricing in rate cuts for next year, where you're at relative to the market, and does that change if inflation tends to be a little bit stickier than everyone is thinking it's going to be right now. Yeah, 100%. That is the key market. Well, there are two key market risks, right? We are currently in a Goldilocks top-down market regime, which obviously is, is sort of coalescing or uh, being uh, supported by this rising probability of a, of a soft landing or the the risen, perhaps at this point, it's the risen probability of a soft landing. Uh, the market risk from that Goldilocks top-down market regime are twofold. One, you can move into pricing in what our system will call deflation because of a hard landing, or you can move into what our system might call a inflation because of a no landing because we're continue we're seeing adverse outcomes on the inflation front which would obviously unwind all of that uh all those rate cuts that are currently priced in the money markets and so what i'm showing in this chart here uh, are uh, the policy rates for the fed the ecb uh the uh, the bank of england bank of japan that's the shaded uh, area uh plots and then the uh the lines in each of these charts show uh, the over- overnight index swap rates minus the policy rate across various tenors. So the blue line is a three-month tenor, the uh, red line is a six-month tenor, the purple line is a nine-month tenor, and the green line is the one-year tenor. And as you can see for the Fed, or for the you know for the U.S. monetary policy uh, construct, 
we're pricing in almost, you know, 200 basis points, 193 basis points to be exact of rate cuts, uh, you know, over the next uh, 12 months. Now, that's very aggressive in the context of what may be sticky inflation, call it one, two, perhaps three quarters uh, in the future. Now, again, this is a key market risk. This is something that if it starts to get unwound at the margins and likely will, if we see uh, adverse outcomes on the inflation front, then it will cause some, some issues for asset markets. Now, again, I, I keep going back to where we started this conversation, which is right now our, our, our two main quantitative risk management systems are not telling us that this is something we need to be overly concerned about right now. Now, they will at some point if we're, you know, if that sticky inflation, you know, if what we're seeing is emergent signs of sticky inflation become actual sticky inflation, i.e. we just can't seem to get inflation below three and a half, the, you know, three to three and a half percent on the super core type inflation numbers, then that's going to create some serious issues uh, for the mar for monetary policy and for what's ultimately priced in asset markets. And a lot of this financial conditions easing that has been priced in the markets really since the beginning of November, which we called for, um, is going to have to come out and, and, and go in reverse. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably f be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code Margin10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. Yeah. Darius, to, to change track a little bit, I think one, one other underlying uh, driver that folks have been generally pretty wrong on for the last couple of years has been energy in general. And I think a lot of folks missed the the run up in oil. Uh, and that was certainly a part of what made inflation sticky, I think, over the 2021, 2022 time period. Obviously, it's run off quite a bit uh, thus far, but I'd be very curious. I know there was a, a little red um, circle around commodities, and I'm guessing that's kind of a, a growth um, related thing. But you know, walk us through how you're thinking about commodities and I guess uh, the price of oil specifically. Yeah, hundred percent, man. That's uh, one of those things that sells things that our weather model has been uh, right as rain on in in, in recent months. The bearish uh, uh, indication for the uh, commodity space. Uh, it's, this has been pretty persistent for for several months now, uh, and it's really um, it's really kept our clients on the right side of that uh, the risk in that market because I think it's you know commodities. If you if it's like the obvious contrarian play, right? Like last year was mega cap tech and 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 you know all the things that tend to do really well in Goldilocks like crypto and. Uh, and, and even in, even in Q4, the bond market got joined in there. Uh, credit obviously worked really well last year as well. And you think about, OK, if last year was just what everyone was not positioned for at the beginning of the year, excluding 42 macro because we weren't in that uh, hard landing consensus, um, it, it, what everyone was in position for is what worked. And you think about what could potentially work in 2024, it's obviously commodities. So we have to be very aware and acutely aware of some of the drivers of that market and ultimately what could cause that to change. And we do a tremendous amount of fundamental research, not just here in the U.S. economy, but for all the major economies in the world. And we continue to see evidence of structural oversupply and demand deficiencies in the Chinese economy. And in my opinion, I think until we see some, you know, some really forceful countercyclical policy or some material structural reforms, I think the former is much more likely than the latter, if, if either is, is particularly uh, probable. The, until we see either of those outcomes that will address those structural undersupply, uh, oversupply issues in the Chinese economy or those structural demand deficiency issues in the Chinese economy, we're going to continue to see neutral to bearish price action uh, and bring crude oil. The main driver in terms of investor models and investor mental and physical models on, on what actually drives the commodity market is China. You know, we continue to be in a bearish trend, both in terms of the Chinese economy and the Chinese asset markets. And I, until that changes, in my opinion, I think we're going to have a, a continue to see a flag in commodity prices. Yeah, Darius, I'm glad you brought up China. That was where I wanted to go next with you, because I'm, I'm looking at a, a chart of the Hong Seng. And that is that is actually it is touching its COVID lows, essentially. It's been a really tough, uh, a tough last couple of years for the Chinese stock market. And I'm wondering, I, obviously, there are some uh, underlying economic drivers that it sounds like you were just starting to get into. I, I do wonder, I, I hear this discussed less, but it, it would make sense to me that when Xi Jinping did his little dance with Jack Ma a while ago um, and uh, uh, basically signaled to the market that they were they were not afraid to, um, you know, 
uh, disrupt powerful uh, tech companies and interfere with big entrepreneurs um, and crack down on the the tech and educational sector out of China. I mean, it's been it's been uh, not great, and I can imagine investors applying a sort of discount to Chinese equities the same way that you might get a discount to, you know, cash flowing companies that are based out of Russia because the government might there's a risk that they might come in and and grab all of that from you. So you know, is that part of the story, or what exactly is going on with uh, Chinese, let's say the equities, but, but asset markets more broadly. Hundred percent. I mean, I think that is a story, in my opinion. Um, you know, we obviously, have, you know, institutional clients all over the world that do different things. A lot of them run global money across asset classes, and some of them, when I talk to the equity guys who run global money, um, they cannot be in Chinese equities anymore. It's just you just you just it's the career risk associated with being in this particular asset class is too great. The juice is not worth the squeeze. Is the mentality amongst the global buy side, and then, and again. We know what's going to cause this to reverse, but the things that are going to cause it to reverse, uh, uh, Emperor Xi uh, Jinping has been very reluctant to pursue those kinds of policies. In fact, he's pursued for the past, you know, for the two of the past four years or three of the past five years, they've really pursued uh, the exact opposite policies that would get Western uh, investors uh, particularly excited about, uh, you know, kind of um, long term capital in this particular market. Um, if you think about the three red arrows and all those kinds of things, and they're slightly unwinding that at the margins, but the reality is, is that kind of still is the baseline policy uh, for 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 the Chinese property sector, which is now in outright deflation uh, for the first time, in, you know, since I want to say 2015 or 2016, and and could persist uh, in deflation. Um, if you look at um, you know, we will you know, I'll just show my uh our uh, our our global liquidity monitor here uh for the for, you know for so we keep track keep tabs and Delta trend in level terms across all the major economies, across growth, inflation, and policy. And so let's just kind of walk across uh, the table with respect to China. And so this is kind of where our, this is our starting point for performing fundamental research in any economy. We need to know what's happening with respect to growth, what's happening with respect to policy, and, or sorry, what's happening to inflation and how those two things are, are kind of combining to, uh, to influence policy at any given point and that we can start dr drilling down into particular topics and subject matters from there. But just kind of just a kind of high level overview for China, Chinese GDP growth is slowing. It's obviously below trend. You know, it's the leading indicators for growth. If you look at the composite PMI, it's also slowing. The unemployment rate's trending higher as well. The economic surprises are negative and, and getting worse. Um, if you look at headline CPI, uh, that number is uh, in deflation. Uh, core CPI is not as trending lower and it looks like it might be an outright deflation uh, as well. So inflation surprises are negative. Uh, Chinese, uh, they've done a good job of adding liquidity uh, into the system vis-a-vis uh, -vis the PBOC. The PBOC is uh, really doing yeoman's work. They're really the only game in town as it relates to uh, Chinese policy right now because you're not really seeing uh, much of a um, much of a uh, response in terms of the fiscal uh, support for the economy. This fiscal balance has actually declined to about three percent, uh, at least in terms of the target that we're going to get for 2024. So you're not you're just not, and even on the current account at 1.8 percent, you know this number is as low as it's been in quite a while and trending lower. So we're not getting the uh, the current account, the, the the income flows that have historically supported the Chinese property sector, which has been, you know, kind of the key driver of the Chinese economy at about 25 to 30 percent of GDP. So there's a lot of bad stuff going on uh, in the Chinese economy that is not being adequately addressed by countercyclical mo monetary and fiscal policy or the, they're doing countercyclical monetary policy. But obviously, they're well past the point of oversupply and demand efficiency that they actually need to see some Keynesian fiscal support as well from a cyclical standpoint. But if they choose not to go down that road, then they're going to have to get very aggressive with structural reforms that can support the household uh, income and household balance sheets uh, you know, much more than they currently are being supported uh, in that in that particular economy. So, you know, China's in a really tough spot. You know, I don't want to dogpile on the China here because every, you know, every bone in my investing body tells me that, you know, this is a trade that's, you know, very long in the tooth. Um, you know, I wouldn't be out here recommending investors be short China. But certainly, you're not going to get any real significant interest amongst the institutional, the global buy side uh, in this particular asset class and in this particular region until we see some of those reforms. And right now, why in the hell would you buy China or Baidu or any one of these major Chinese tech companies? We can go buy uh, Microsoft and you know their inclusion in AI, and you go buy Nvidia. You know, it's just there's no real reason to from a growth perspective, and you're also not getting it from a policy perspective as well. Mm. Could you not say, uh, Darius, from a contrarian perspective, that actually the Magnificent Seven and China are both getting long in the tooth as trades? Because yeah. <laughs> the Magnificent Seven, it has been, it has been pretty up only for a pretty long period of time. For by the way, that, those stocks have been long in the tooth my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> They've gone straight the hell up my entire career. I know. You're you, right. You put a banana to my head. I'm probably some. I'm closer to perma bull than I am perma bear for sure. I'm neither. 
on perma whatever is working and, and, and obviously having, uh, you know, sophisticated risk management systems that can get us in and out of the appropriate trades. And, you know, generally speaking, just, you know, throw some stats at you. There's only about two or three times a year where you need to reposition your portfolio. On average, obviously, no, no year is the same, but uh, on average is about two or three times a year we need to reposition your portfolio according to our global macro risk matrix, which is currently, you know, pricing and Goldilocks that we talked about at the beginning of the year. At some point, it, there's going to be two or three times a year where you have to make a different trade and, and, and reposition your portfolio if you want to stay on the right side of market risk. Some people just elect not to stay on the right side of market risk. They just want to be on the right side of the risk they want to take. And that obviously could create some very positive long-term returns at the expense of obviously having a terrible year, terrible month, terrible quarter, et cetera. We, our buy-side clients can't have terrible months, terrible quarters, terrible years because they get fired and they can't feed their family. So uh, we try to orient our risk management process around supporting them. And ultimately, it's proven to be quite uh, supportive for our retail clients as well. Mm. Darius, I, I want to end by uh, talking about Bitcoin with you. So I noticed that is also a, a neutral uh, on your chart. But, you know, we had a pretty interesting catalyst this past week. Obviously, the Bitcoin ETFs have grabbed quite a bit of headlines. I was looking at the most, there's a little bit of a lag when it comes to especially flow data. But, you know, I was looking at the latest um, and we, there, there have been looks like about uh, just over a billion in uh, net inflows. Uh, obviously, it's been more in the the newborn nine, as, as Eric uh, Balkunas calls it, but uh, we've seen pretty significant outflows from GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which was basically a closed-end fund structure with you know, 2% uh, fee. They've converted that into an ETF successfully, but they've maintained 150 basis points. So there are a lot of investors that have been trapped in that uh, for a long time and are now trying to get out. Has been about, you know, between three and five hundred million dollars of outflows of that product on day to day basis alone. Wow. But it's still net, uh, net. I'll actually let me. I'll actually just grab the statistics for you. But yeah, I, I would be curious in general uh, how you're thinking about Bitcoin from both a macro standpoint and then how you weight the ETFs uh, if you do it all. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the the short answer is as long as we're in a Goldilocks uh, regime or even in a reflation regime, those are the two risk on regimes in our process. We are going to see positive inflows into the crypto asset class. That's what people do when, when you're pricing when markets are pricing in Goldilocks, right? You know, that's when people that's markets do when they're pricing in reflation. And so it's our job as as investors, obviously, is to refresh the macro weather model to see if something's changing from an economic standpoint that supports, you know, kind of positioning, transitioning out of Goldilocks in a um in a reasonable time horizon. Or if there's some, you know, if there's something in the fundamental economy that supports transitioning out of Goldilocks, you know, the couple, uh, the few things I'll say that have been very supportive uh, for crypto and Bitcoin in particular have been this aggressive surge in liquidity that we've seen, um, you know, really since, um, you know, kind of really since October, it kind of started liquidity bottomed uh, in October globally uh, and has really trended higher and it's trended higher primarily on the back of public private sector liquidity creation. A lot of investors are myopically focused on central banks and and some are focused on uh, the fiscal authorities in terms of uh, liquidity provision. But the reality is the commercial banking sector and the non-bank financial sector creates just as much, if not more liquidity at various intervals than those particular agents. And so we have to kind of keep a holistic view on that. And we do, obviously, in our research, those uh, those elements are featured in that weather model as well. And so it's our view that based on the leading indicators for the liquidity cycle that we you know perform statistical uh, analysis on is that we're going to continue to see positive liquidity over the medium term. Now, is it going to be a linear 45 degree angle line up? Probably not. You know, these things are, are rarely, um, you know, that, that straightforward. Uh, but the reality is we should expect to see positive liquidity provision in 20, throughout 2024 up until the point where the narrative around inflation changes, the narrative around, um, you know, what's priced into money markets from a, uh, from a, from a rate cutting uh, perspective changes because those things will undo the current countercyclical drivers of the surge in private sector liquidity. Right now, declining uh, bond market volatility is a big driver of the private sector liquidity creation that we're, we're uh, monitoring in our models. Uh, declining uh, uh, currency volatility is a big driver. Declining crude oil is a big driver of those things. So all those things, and obviously the declining dollar has been a big uh, factor as well. And all those things have contributed to that, again, that positive surge in private sector liquidity globally. If we start to see an unwind of this inflation narrative here in the U.S., that takes us out of pricing in all those rate cuts and creates a lot of financial market volatility through the bond market, through the currency market, then that liquidity feature is going to be done. But again, I'm not here to tell you, Mike, when that's going to occur, because most people who try to tell you when that's going to occur wind up losing money. The reality is just doing this, approaching this statistically, most investors lose money, most particularly retail investors in the, in the financial markets, because they're too busy predicting when things like that change. The reality is you're better off just observing when the change happens in real time and actually repositioning for your, your portfolio as a function of that. This will be the last time I 
bring this up because I've said it now on a couple podcasts, but I was talking to this guy who's been in macro for a long time. He gave me a funny framework for thinking about retail participants in markets. It's it's almost if you think about a three-year-old and every time you show a three-year-old something, everything is new, right? It's either great and really exciting or like terrible. And it's the worst thing and people are crying. It. It's just, I, I thought that was a very funny, uh, it's, it could be that, you know, come off as a little condescending, but that, you know, retail, there are, there are very sophisticated retail people in they're a doctor or they're a very accomplished business person, but that doesn't necessarily translate to being smart in financial markets and making good trading or investment decisions. Actually, sometimes they're weirdly antithetical. So like, this has this has less to do with your investment results than what's in here. Like oh, the yeah, yeah. part of investing yeah. is way more important than now your sophistication level. Like a monkey can just execute a trend following strategy with more success than the average sophisticated investor does in terms of picking tops and bottoms all the time. I guarantee you. I mean, any any study would tell you that. Yeah. So I were for those of you who are following along via by audio, not video, just to correct here, um, it was about 1.2 billion in in net inflows into the the uh, Bitcoin ETFs, and that that accounts for actually 1.6 billion in outflows from GBTC alone. So the total inflows across the the products is actually almost almost three billion, and uh, just uh, just shy of 12 billion dollars worth of trading volume. So. Yeah, it's been. I mean, it'll be interesting to see. It's something that people definitely within the the Bitcoin and crypto space have been waiting for for such a long time. I think everyone's hopes were a little bit too high, including my own. So, you know, I think it'll it'll be. Uh, it'll. It, I think a long term, obviously, it's definitely good for the space and for adoption too. I gotta. I gotta admit, it's funny for me to see Larry Fink get on TV and shill Bitcoin and Ethereum and tokenization and like. What kind of simulation am I living? I I guess I thought eventually this would happen, but it's been interesting to see the degree to which they've got on board with it. So yeah, no, it's it's been it's been phenomenal, man. Um, look, you know, you've you've you heard me preach this preach the choir for many years now. Bitcoin is a it's it's on its way to becoming an institutional asset class. Uh, so much so that obviously the SEC was effectively pressured into uh, adopting these uh, to to granting the the inclusion of these uh, assets as ETFs. Uh, something we do with 42 Macro, and we can end on this, uh, is our KISS portfolio construction process, which has always included Bitcoin as one of the um, one of the features yep. of this process. You know, so what yep. we're trying to do is help investors migrate. Uh, and one of the things I think we're doing a great job of here at 42 Macro is helping investors migrate from traditional 60-40 to 60-30-10. And that 10 in that 60-30-10 is Bitcoin. Uh, it can be gold, it could be commodities, but for now, you know, our the way we think about this, and certainly something that I personally believe in, is that it should be Bitcoin. Um, but obviously, if you add something as much as 10% Bitcoin to a traditional investment portfolio, you're going to have wild results from a, a max drawdown perspective. Uh, obviously, you can crash uh, much more frequently. And so what we've done is design a, a trend following strategy with risk management overlays, both from a top down and bottom up perspective, that actually cut out that left tail risk and allow you to keep the upside uh, from the returns. And so you kind of just, I'm um, just kind of summarizing all this. You look at the uh, statistics, uh, the, the, the statistics over here, you know, our CRISPR portfolio construction process has an average annual return of plus 12%, which compares very favorably to the 60-40 return of plus 7%. But if you look at it on the max drawdown basis, you're talking about a max drawdown of minus 11% in terms of our process versus minus 22% for 60-40 and minus 25% for running 60-30-10 money without those top down and bottom up risk management overlays. And oh, by the way, you've crashed three times if you didn't have that those overlays. So, um, you know, definitely come holler at us and check us out. If you are a, you know, obviously if you're a Bitcoiner, you don't need to Darius Dell institutional macro person telling you how to allocate to Bitcoin. But if you are someone, a serious investor with serious money in a multi-asset portfolio context that wants to include Bitcoin in your portfolio and you don't know how and you want to act the, the, the opinions of guidance of experts, we are the experts uh, globally on this particular subject matter. Yeah, I would underline that last point with a big fat marker. And Darius, it's always, always a pleasure when we get to chat. And uh, I would highly recommend, guys, if you're not familiar with 42 Macro, you probably will be at this point if you're a listener of On The Margin, but go check out the stuff that Darius does. And Darius, if, if folks want to either follow you or find out more about 42 Macro, what's the easiest way for them to do that? Oh, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. So just uh, come to our website. Uh, you can sign up for like our, our newsletters and our and our insights. Uh, we publish a lot of uh, you know content beyond our paywall, obviously. Uh, but obviously, the, the real juice, uh, the stuff that's going to help you make it save money is obviously reserved for our clients. So, uh, And then you can follow me on Twitter as well at, at DarryStale42. Mike, man, this has been great, man. Thanks for having me. Always, always have a pleasure. Absolutely, partner. We'll have to do it again soon. Thanks, Darius. Appreciate you. Cheers. Cheers.